what are some of the non-positive things? Okay, so the, so the cons of the will is wills go through probate. That's, that's number one. So you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to go through the probate process if you have a will. The will is not effective to transfer anything by itself. It has to be approved by the probate court. The executor that is nominated in the will, but the probate court appoints the executor. So if you were to take, um, let's say I passed away and my wife Debbie were to take our wills into the bank. And they said, she said, hey, look, Chris named me as the executor, and I'm also the person that is the heir under the will. The bank would go, that's really sweet, Debbie. We're glad Chris took care of you. Now go down to the probate court mm -hmm. and get a judge to sign something that, that tells us that we have to do it. Right. And that's what letters testamentary are. Right. Uh, um, the court essentially approving that the will is, is valid and naming who has the power over the will. Um, that's the other con, is uh, the will is really about nominating and making clear your wishes, but the power over that will still rests in, ultimately in the hands of the probate court. The probate judge is the one that appoints the executor. Your executor is gonna have to submit an inventory of your assets as part of the probate process. The judge has to approve that inventory. If there's disputes about anything under the terms of your will or a beneficiary contests the terms of your will, the probate judge is gonna make the decisions about those contests. So really the power in a will really is housed at the probate court. Um, the, uh, one of the negatives about that is wills are a little, little easier to contest than trusts are. It's much easier to bust a will than it is to bust a trust. And uh, so that tends to be a, um, a problem. That's also true of beneficiary designations. It's much harder to bust up a beneficiary designation than it is to bust up a will. Um, probably um, another con is that there's, there's really two types of assets that make up an estate. One is probate assets and one is non-probate assets. So non-probate assets are things that pass by contract, mm -hmm. generally. So your retirement accounts, your investment accounts, your bank accounts, things of that nature. Um, your will doesn't control those things. Your beneficiary designation does. And so those are going to pass outside the probate process. That is very confusing for a lot of people. They think, well, I was named as the beneficiary in the will, but here, Jay got my bank account. How did that happen? Well, it's because the bank account passed through right of survivorship or beneficiary designation and, and not through the will. And so that can be somewhat problematic. So we see kind of that unfunded estate situation occasionally with wills too. Um, and then I'd say that just kind of piggybacking on what we talked about when people do their own wills or pull it out of a book. Um, the, the problem is that uh, a lot of wills are just not done well. And they either are defective in some way or they just don't take into account all of the considerations. And so that's, that's kind of another, uh, another con that we see with wills, especially with so many people trying to draft their own now. Right. With, with a will drawn up will though, the, Probate in the state of Texas is not is not that horrible for, for most situations. It it really depends on what kind of probate it is. Um, the there there are many different types of probate process in Texas. So you might have a probate as muniment of title or an independent administration probate. Those are those are less cumbersome mm -hmm. than the traditional dependent administration or mother may I type probate process that most people hear horror stories about. But what I'm surprised about constantly in practice, um, I think I told you earlier, I, I did a, a state planning seminar yesterday kind of for the general public. And, and after I do those seminars, what, what amazes me is um, <clears throat> how many people come out up to me afterwards and talk to me about the problems 
that they had during the course of their probate and how burdensome it was, how delayed things got in the probate process, wow. um, how much disagreements there were, um, those sorts of things. And so while it is possible to have a kind of a smooth uh, probate process, particularly in Texas, um, I'd say one that's not generally the case in other states. And uh, number two, what I find walks into my office or that I hear about is lots of people who uh, had really bad experiences in the probate process. Another thing I've found is people that have out-of-state interest in anything, land or, or oil, royalties or whatever, is a, is a huge problem. In oh, that situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, because if you ha have stuff in more than one state, uh, even if you've got a really great wit written will, and let's say that the will is valid in all of the states in which you have property, the truth is that you've got to do what's called an ancillary probate in the states where you're not a resident. So you do a, a, a probate in your state and an ancillary probate in the other states. So, um, you know, like we, we had a client recently that they owned a house here in Texas, a house in Colorado, and then they had inherited property in Utah. Well, if they had died with a will and only a will, what we would have ended up doing was we would have probated their primary state in Texas and then we would have probated two more times, once in Utah and once in, in Colorado. Um, but for some people, you know, a will is really is really good enough, and I would say that's kind of the base level of estate planning. Mm -hmm. So if if clients have problems about doing more advanced planning than that, they at least ought to do a will because they at least ought to take advantage of as much of the uh, particularly the Texas probate code right. as they can. Right, that's great. So who can execute a will? The funny thing about executing the will is the standard is very, very low. Um, you uh, Basically, you have to be someone who is an adult or an emancipated minor, somebody that has legal capacity. Um, and what they basically have to understand is they have to understand the consequences of making the will. So if I name you as being the beneficiary of my estate, I've got to understand that, that, that my stuff is going to go to you. And I also have to understand who are the natural, natural objects of my affection. So I have to know, gosh, my, I would normally give it to my wife, but I'm choosing Jay instead. So, um, but as long as I understand, as long as I'm an adult and I have, nobody's taken away my legal capacity in court, and as long as I understand who I would normally give stuff to and how I am giving it in the will, that's really all that's required. And that is a much lower standard than what we think of as typically capacity. It's also a much lower standard than what we generally consider capacity for signing a contract. So it's, it's kind of interesting how, how low that capacity could be. So one practical examination or kind of example of that is uh, sometimes with um, elderly clients, they'll have a little bit of dementia, and a lot of times they'll have what's called um, sundowner syndrome, mm -hmm. which is they're really good right. in the morning, and the closer it gets to sundown, the less well that they do in their mental capacity. So those, those folks, perfectly okay for them to sign a will. It's not a problem at all. But when you conduct the signing, you probably want to do it at 8 o'clock in the morning, not 5 o'clock in the evening, um, when they're at kind of their highest and best peak. But legal capacity for signing a will is a very low standard. Wow. Wow. So what are some of the clauses in wills? So what you're going to see when you, when you draft a will or when you see a will that's been drafted is... Uh, you're going to see kind of some standard clauses that you should look for. And so if somebody brings you in a will, you ought to be able to clearly identify these. And quite frankly, you need to identify them too because I think they're on your, your uh, CFP exam. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, that's that would, that the other help. practical yeah. element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the first one is what we would call an introductory clause or an identification clause. It just sets out 
this is who I am and I'm, I'm making a will, this is where I'm a resident of. Um, typically there'll be a declaration clause and in that declaration clause you'll, you'll kind of declare, hey, I am making my last will and testament and um, and this is this is what I want done. So you're 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 doing that. Uh, sometimes we'll see a, what's called a specific bequest. And so a specific bequest is some item or some amount of money that you want to pass to a certain individual. So you may have a will that says, well, let me let me stop there. Um, what will what we also typically see is a residuary bequest or a remainder bequest. And so that is, this is where I want the bulk of my estate to go. And so the way those two work together, the specific bequest and the residuary bequest is, um, let's say in my case, I, I really want my entire estate to go to my wife, but I'd like for you to have my car. So I put in my will that I want Jay Metter to have my car and the residue of my estate goes to my wife. So the car is a specific bequest and the rest of the estate is the residuary clause. So my wife is gonna get everything other than the car, uh, which you're gonna get. Um, in a will, you're also going to see uh, an executor clause or an appointment clause, which um, is where you're gonna nominate your executor. Um, we often see in wills a guardianship clause. So if you have minor kids, um, you're gonna put in a clause into the will that says this is who I would want to raise my kids if I cannot raise them myself. Um, we'll see a, uh, a, a tax appointment clause. So we'll, what that'll do is it, we, we talked earlier about the division of costs between specific bequests and, and the remainder bequest. So what we'll see in that tax appointment clause, it'll say this, if estate taxes have to be paid, this is how those are gonna be paid. Or this is how the debts of the estate are gonna be paid and who's gonna share in that. Um, we see an attestation clause, which is really about the signature, right? So. We'll see the signature and we'll see a couple of witnesses' signature. If you're in Florida, we'll see three witness signatures. Um, and so it just, it's you attesting that this is my last will and testament and I approve of the distribution scheme that I set out. And then what you should see at the end of the will, which is often left out of wills, is a, what's called a self-proving affidavit clause. And the self-proving affidavit clause will again be the, the uh, person making the will, it'll be them affirming in front of a notary public that this is their last will and testament, that they're over the age of 18, that they're competent, that they understood what they were signing, that they were signing as their free act indeed, and that they signed in front of the witnesses. And then the witnesses will be swearing that they're over the age in Texas of 14, that the person signing the will is over the age of 18, that, they're, that the person signing the will is competent, that they signed in the presence of the witnesses and that the witnesses signed in the presence of each other. And then that self-proving affidavit is notarized by a notary public who is different than the person signing the will and different than the two witnesses to the will. And, um, Basically what that allows you to do, that self-proving affidavit, um, allows you to probate the will without having the witnesses to the will show up at the probate court. <laughs> that would be important, yeah. 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 It's especially important because like um, in this one estate that we did that we probated, which was very expensive to probate because of this reason, we had, uh, well first we had handwritten will. Um, so that was a starting point. They actually did have two witnesses to the will and they had pulled up something from Office Depot, I think, and, and written down the essentially the attestation clause. And they had had the two witnesses plus themselves sign in that, in that clause, which was fine, except it didn't have the self-proving affidavit. Well, they had gotten this will signed, I kid you not, at the local Ford dealership. The two witnesses to the will 
were two employees at the Ford dealership. One of them was a receptionist and one of them worked in the finance office. Why they agreed to be witnesses to the will, I don't have any idea. Well, we had to subpoena them to court in order to prove up the, the will. And so the one young lady happened to still live in town. And so we found her relatively easily, even though she did not work at the Ford dealership anymore. The other one we found, she did still live in the general county that, that, uh, where the dealership was located, but she spent six months of the year in Pennsylvania. Oh, goody. So we ended up having to subpoena her in Pennsylvania she told us we had to set the probate hearing basically around the holidays, when she, which is a very hard time to get a court hearing, by the way. <laughs> uh, but we had to, had to get her to <clears throat> agree to fly back from Pennsylvania the moment she stepped off the plane in Texas, because we don't really have subpoena power in Pennsylvania, to right. be honest with you. But once she stepped off the plane at Intercontinental, we had a process server server with a subpoena <laughs> to show up at the hearing. So... Um, but those are the kinds of things that that happen, you know, if you don't have the self-proving affidavit on there. So if you if you're reviewing somebody's will with them, those are the those are the standard clauses that you want to look for. Um, and and truthfully, if somebody asks you to kind of look over their will uh, as the financial planner, I would concentrate on looking at the will for the distribution scheme and whether it fits with the financial plan. And if you have any questions whatsoever about the validity Absolutely. of the will, Contact go that. call an attorney. That's exactly right. Don't Contact try their attorney. Yep. Don't That's try to go through your materials and right. say, well, does it have a residuary clause? Does it have, you know, self-proving affidavit? I mean, if it's something that you notice, let it be a red flag for you to pick up the phone and call somebody yeah. else. Absolutely. So what are some of the other clauses that we might see in wills? So um, sometimes we'll put into wills what's called a simultaneous death clause. So for a married couple, we might say, well, if the husband dies, if the husband and wife die together in a car accident, we're going to presume that one or the other of them dies first. Um, and there's reasons to do that that are... <laughs> Uh, uh, probably more complex than what you're ever going to need to know, but right. it's basically to effectuate other parts of the estate plan, right. especially for high net worth individuals. Um, typically, we'll have a survivorship clause. So we'll say, okay, well, um, we don't want to get into simultaneous death situations or deaths where you know, a son or daughter survives the mom or dad only by an hour or two. We don't want to get into all that. So what we're going to say is you're not a survivor unless you you survive the decedent by at least 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. Um, and so it kind of clears up the, the situation where an entire family passes away essentially in a, in a single accident. Um, Sometimes it'll have uh, disclaimer notices in there where it, it is possible to refuse um, an inheritance. Right. And so it'll have something in there that allows you to refuse the inheritance and make clear how that refusal needs to be communicated. Um, contingent beneficiaries. So uh, think of these as backups to the backup. So. You might have, uh, like in, in my estate plan, my wife is my primary beneficiary. Well, my contingent beneficiary, so if my wife dies with me, um, doesn't survive me because she doesn't survive past 30 days, or if she decides to disclaim the inheritance, then it would pass to my contingent beneficiaries who are my children. Um, and usually what we recommend to clients is they have a couple levels of contingent beneficiaries so that, um, you know, the, the Aggie basketball team doesn't just go with five players. They got seven more on the bench. Right. You want to have some more on the bench um, for exactly that reason. Uh, 
one of the things that we often see in wills and that we always put in wills is a no contest clause. If you want to go down and contest mom and dad's will at the probate court, we want you to have skin in the game. We want you to have to make a decision. We want you to have something at risk. Because ultimately what we want is we want mom or dad's wishes followed. That's why they made the will in the first place. And so what we want to do is disincentivize you from going down and challenging the will. And so the typical uh, no contest clause will say that if you file a will contest, then you're presumed not to have survived. So you have lost whatever is given to you. In the wow. So um, you want you want to do that. Um, the the other one that we typically see is a, a what's called a contingent trust. Remember we talked before a little bit about when we were talking about beneficiary designations. We talked about do not list minor beneficiaries. Right. Okay. So. Typically, one of the contingent beneficiaries will be kind of a catch-all, like my heirs at law. So, like, if you look at my will, um, you'd see my wife is the first choice, my kids is the second choice, and then you would see our heirs at law as kind of the ultimate backup. Well, it is possible that one of those heirs at law could be my niece, Marilyn Grace, who is three. Well... She's three, she's a minor, right? So how are we gonna deal with a minor beneficiary? Now we're gonna talk about minor beneficiaries later on, but one of the cleanest ways to do it is to put a contingent trust in the will that says anyone who is under a certain age, whatever they inherit from my estate is gonna go into a trust for their benefit until they hit a certain milestone. Right. And so typically in our office, what we do is we'll make the contingent trust anybody who is under age 25 um, who inherits, we're going to put into a trust for their benefit until they hit age 25. And then when they hit age 25, then they'll get a check for whatever's left in the trust at that time. That's good. And, and so, uh, like I said, I, I firmly believe that the you know, young adults' brains aren't fully formed <laughs> until at least they graduate from college. And so, uh, or in my case, you still yeah, maybe I was living not. Proof of that yeah. statement. Yeah. So, we're going to um, not go there. So, it's good to have that kind of backup trust uh, in place for those, for those contingencies.